Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gloria Blackwell, AAUW's Chief Executive Officer, and welcome to our International Women's Day 2022 celebration in conversation with Dr. Esther Ngumbi, AAUW Fellowships and Grants alumna. I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker today, AAUW International Fellowships alumna, Dr. Esther Ngumbi. She is an author, researcher, ed educator, mentor, speaker, and champion for change around the issues of hunger, gender education, youth activism, agriculture, sustainability, and public service. She is currently an assistant professor in the Entomology and African American Studies departments at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. In 2012, Dr. Ngumi launched Spring Break Kenya, an organization that mobilizes university students for public service and has served over 5,000 participants. That same year, she and her parents co-founded the Dr. Ndumi Faulu Academy to ensure that more children in Kenya have access to quality education. She has also served as a mentor for girls and African students through former President Obama's Young African Leadership Program, the Clinton Global Init University Initiative, and Akili Dada, among others. In 2014, Dr. Ngumbi founded Oyeska Greens, an agriculture-focused startup that empowers farmers on the Kenyan coast with the goal of promoting food security by engaging in climate smart agriculture. Since 2014, they have worked with over 1,000 farmers. And in 2016, Dr. Ngumbi's efforts led her community to host the first World Food Day celebrations for Kuala County. She is the recipient of multiple national and international awards, including the first 2017 Emerging Sustainability Leader Award, the 2017 Woman of Courage Award, and the 2018 Society of Experimental Biology President's Medal. And she's also received three U.S. patents for her research. She's been pretty busy. She has delivered talks on her work around the world and has written for numerous publications. Dr. Ngumbi believes that everyone has the right to live a dignified life and has dedicated her passion, intellect, heart, and resources to bringing sustainable change in her community and is a powerful role model for women and girls. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Esther Ngumbi. Some of our audience, some of you may recognize her uh, because she was featured in our 125th anniversary video for AAUW's Fellowships and Grants programs almost a decade ago. Esther, you've certainly achieved so much since then, and welcome. Thank you, Gloria, and thank you, AAUW, and all the women Hi. tuning in. Great. I'm just so excited that you're joining us today. So let's let's just start. All, all of our alumni have a fellowship story. So let's just start with uh, the fact that you were awarded an AAUW International Fellowship in 2007-2008 academic year. Can you tell us about how that award impacted your research and your studies during that time when you got your fellowship? And of course, why you chose the field of entomology. Thank you once again. And um, back in 2007, I, I remember my advisor telling me that, uh, look, uh, we funded you for several years and uh, we don't have funding for you uh, to continue uh, your studies. That moment felt like a punch below my stomach because I, for one second, I uh, just paused for a moment and thought about the journey that I had taken, the journey that I had walked through to get to uh, the United States, to get to pursue uh, my PhD. And all of a sudden to know that that could end it was frightening to say the least. But then uh, 
again, I quickly uh, started finding out what are the available options. Uh, there are fellowships for women like me who are persistent, who want to uh, make headway and uh, become a, a professor and we really achieve that what uh, at times seemed to be an unachievable dream. And then I came across AAUW. And when I read through the mission, the values and what they do, and most importantly that they support women like me, it was almost a moment of, okay, breathe in, breathe out. It's not all over. And so I applied and I poured my heart out and shared the very, very uh, essence of why I was in need of this scholarship and what this scholarship would do for my journey. And again, I still remember that April, that wonderful April when I got the email that, yes, I was the recipient of a 2007-2008 fellowship. I remember crying. I remember just all of a sudden having almost like a second wave of renewal. I knew that my journey was not over. What did it do to me? First of all, it allowed me to uh, continue on my quest to attain a PhD in entomology. Quest to, uh, first of all, just get an education. And why? Because an education for me is the gateway, was the gateway out of poverty, was the gateway to, uh, for many other girls that were looking up to me to say, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter your background. There are fellowships out there. There are organizations that do indeed support women. And that for me, the getting that award was almost a life game changer. It is up to today. It allowed me to continue on and finally get my PhD. And to date, I still thrive. I still enjoy the benefits of education. Education liberated me, set me free. Education allowed me, a girl like me from a small village in Kenya to be in an institution today at the University of Illinois. Education just has opened so many pathways. And I am grateful that even today, 140 years later, AAU is still giving fellowships, is still creating those moments where women, again, women like me, continue on with journeys. And thank you, AAUW. And I always, I, I always say, and I say it in the 2010 video that I will give back. I will look back and open the doors for many, many more girls to get an education. That's fantastic. Thank you. You know, it all it still gives me chills when I hear people tell the story of kind of where they were when they were received a fellowship, when they got the word. Um, so many people were on the brink of having it go off in a completely different direction and not being able to complete their education and, you know, what it meant for AEW to, uh, to step in at that time. And so you mentioned, you talked about AEW. Um, we, we are celebrating our 140th anniversary. And, you know, how has the organization impacted your career to date? So again, first of all, it allowed me to stay on to my program mm -hmm. and eventually uh, finished on uh, summer 2011. That day I graduated with a PhD in entomology. And I still remember walking uh, to uh, the stage. And all of a sudden, uh, a wave of tears uh, came uh, across me because I took a moment to think about my journey 
and to realize that many, many other girls, many, many other women could be walking that stage. And for the reason because their opportunity is not available for many, yet talent, yet smartness, yet uh, every talent is out there. And for me, it was, uh, first of all, a very powerful moment. But then at the, at the same time, it also inspired me to again know that while I had gotten that privilege, I needed to look back. I needed to pave the way for many, many other girls. And so again, here I was, I got in my PhD and uh, started right uh, after my graduation to look back and see what are the programs that I could uh, launch in my hometown, in my community to uh, make it possible for other women from my community and many other communities. Again, with that fellowship, it also, uh, brought with me a community, a community of other women like me, a network of global, a global network that AAUW provided. And also the reassurance that they are always there. And they're always there to support me in many other ways. For me, that has and continues to be profound and continues to be one of the important things that has happened to me because of AAU fellowship. Today, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Illinois. I still remember my application for AAU. I said one of my lifetime goals is to become a professor, a full professor. And I know that I am on the way. I am still working on the way. That's great. Yeah. And that for me again is powerful. And thanks for supporting me and supporting other women and creating this network, global network. Think of it of one, 140 years of creating this network of women. Again. Absolutely. Thank you. So tell, tell us a little bit about the, the, the field of entomology and, you know, how did you decide that this is what I want to study? And that's a good question. So I grew up in a small community where we did not have role models. And the only role models that I saw were bankers, accountants, uh, teachers. And for a while, I wanted to be an accountant. And the reason being my parents would come along with me, they would go with them to the city then to collect paychecks to send us to school. And I would walk in into the bank and see these people that were in their suits and they were living in air conditioned office and I was like, that's the career. But at the same time too, I grew up also, uh, before going to school, we were farmers. So we would go uh, work on our farms and our crops would be thriving. And then all of a sudden, insects would come and take away all our labor. That meant we would be hungry. That meant we would not have enough to eat. And what insects hadn't taken away, drought would. And again, the little that we harvested and stored, stored product insects would come along and take it. And I wondered uh, those early years, what career can I follow, can I pursue to first of all, uh, understand why do insects, how do they even find our farm? And when they find it, why can they just eat a little and leave uh, us who have worked so hard some? And what are the possible ways to uh, prevent insect pest outbreaks? And because it wasn't only a problem in my family, it was a community. I would walk around and see the same issue among my community members. So I knew that I wanted to pursue uh, my career in entomology. And thankfully, when I 
went uh, and did very well in my high school, I was, instead of being called to do bachelors of uh, accounting or commerce, I was called for a bachelor of science. And I still remember the first day I walked into the lab and did the experiments. I was like, this is it. I knew I was gonna be in science and thankfully my mentors, my teachers, the lab uh, coordinators saw a spark in me. Uh, the curiosity was just amazing. And they, I, I was asking and asking and I wanted to live in the lab. And, and so and then, then they, I discovered that indeed, entomology is a career you can pursue entomology. And I was lucky to be called for, uh, to uh, do a Bachelor of Science at uh, Kenyatta University, which is almost 10 minutes away from the International Center of Insect Physiology, a world renowned facility that tackles insect science. And then I was, that was it. I did my master's in entomology, did my PhD in entomology. And today I'm still, are finding solutions that I saw when I was growing up. These challenges are still actually, we've been amplified today by climate change and uh, the progress and we've made is almost being raised by climate change. Thank you, thank you for sharing that because it's really important, I think, for people to understand the way in which a field like entomology is is so important around issues like climate change. Um, and I must say, when I think about entomology versus being an accountant, I'm someone who really doesn't like insects. So I, I think I probably would have ended up being an accountant, but you definitely found, you definitely found your, uh, you found your passion, you know, and, and it shows. Uh, and I think of a way that it showed was how, you know, you launched, um, you know, Spring Break uh, Kenya, where you're mobilizing university students for public service. Uh, that's served over 5,000 participants. Can you talk a little bit about this um, public service piece and how it's really important to encourage young people to engage in public service? Thank you again. And, and um, why public service? First of all, I realized that just throughout my journey, it wasn't uh, people that I knew, it was people that I didn't know. And it was, then I always saw people uh, volunteering to do acts of kindness, volunteering to serve uh, their communities and volunteering not only money, a talent, volunteering uh, that talent that you as an individual has been blessed with. And so for me, it was just easy to galvanize students. And because again, as I grew up and, and realized that service shouldn't only be done in form of donations, service can be done in multiple, multiple ways. And realizing that as I grew up in the community, there was that community came together to uh, mentor me, to be there for me, and, and to help me, they, they almost gal galvanized together to send me to school. I could not forget. And so I wondered what are the possible ways that I could then look back and sound my community. I realized along the way, I gathered so much knowledge about agriculture, about growing crops, about just so many things that I could then turn back and share and learn together and demonstrate. And I realized that I don't have to walk alone because the powerful proverb that says, if you wanna go far, go uh, far, walk alone but if you really want to walk further and further and further galvanize walk with others and so for me it was that galvanizing others and more importantly the young people because they have energy they have creativity in them they have so much and so why not galvanize these young people that are so full of talent, so full of creativity and saying the community was there for us. 
we should be there for them. And we don't have to wait until we become CEOs, we become doctors, we can start. Our time, our talents, and whatever that you can give. So that is how it started. And today, just still, uh, that's the spirit. Because I still believe that public service is the price we pay for living in Mother Earth. And I hope and I keep encouraging everyone, including the young kids today, we have a school. Learn to serve. And as we embed that, uh, that a virtue of service, that spirit of community uh, and public engagement and public service, I think then we grow uh, citizens. We grow citizens that are responsible. We grow citizens that are empathetic. And then we grow a, a world that is full of uh, people that serve one another, people that are empathetic. And together in service, we make our societies, our communities a better place. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I know that so many of us on this call also feel your sense of the necessity uh, of, of public service. Uh, I will, you know, one of the, the changing moments of my own life was being a Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, it really made me look beyond my own self and my own needs to see how I could support others. And, uh, you know, the, the, the life-changing experience that I had when I was young was when I spent time, you know, working in uh, a small village in Africa uh, as a volunteer, and that propelled me into really wanting to, you know, spend my career working in service of others. Um, and it really is an important piece of building a citizenry that really cares about each other in the world. Um, so, so thank you. Uh, and when you talked about education, I mean, it's quite obvious that education clearly provided value to your life. Um, I mentioned in the intro that you, uh, along with your, your family, had started a school. Um, so what was the motivation for starting this school in your home community? Again, um, just uh, circling back to the day I got my PhD and realized that actually I w there was not, nothing special in me. It was just that I was lucky to have had opportunity. I was lucky to have had mentors. I was lucky to have had just luck in general. And realizing that there was nothing wrong with women like me who were born in rural communities, that indeed we could walk and get to uh, achieve those dreams that we uh, have as little selves. And for me, that was the big inspiration, knowing that if given the opportunity, any child can be something, any girl can be a PhD holder. They can be a scientist, they can be an accountant, they can be a doctor. And for me that, and also knowing that education is the gateway out of poverty. Education is the gateway to many, many opportunities. And those two things we combined together and my parents and I agreed that the best gift that we could ever, ever give to our community was education. And I still remember uh, the three of us wondering, here we are, we have such big dreams, we want to provide everything for the girls, but yet we didn't have enough of funds to make it happen. But then we realized that you can use what is in front of you, start small. And that grounding was so important because then we realized, look, we have soil, it's free, let's use it. We have water for that year, it's rained. And my father loved uh, growing trees. So we had trees 
around the compound. So we had everything that we needed to start a school, however small it was. And there we started, 14 students came. And we were just happy because again, we had started with what we have and what was in front of us. And today, when I look back, that one building, today there's so many buildings in the school. It's a compound that has over 90 students or 100 students that come in when school session is to, to get that education. And to know that their lives are changed forever. And that in no time, they may be pilots, they may be uh, research scientists, they may be presidents, I don't know where their talent is, but to have that opportunity to nurture them and to allow them to, to further inspire them to think big and to realize that it doesn't matter where you are, you can achieve that what you aspire has been again such it has been a privilege a big privilege and every day I continue to ask my parents let's use this privilege to empower and to live and to create that empowerment and to send off these kids into wherever their hearts lead them. And that's fantastic. And, and when you think about those 90 to 100 students who come to your school, you know, to get an education, uh, some of whom may not have had an opportunity, you know, to get an education otherwise, you know, it really makes you feel, I, I can imagine how you feel in terms of knowing that your idea and your dream has turned into something very tangible, you know, that's having an impact on the lives of, you know, of these students and, and, and of these children. And as someone who was a who was a teacher, uh, it certainly uh, warms my heart to know that, that that's how you have used your talent and your energy um, to make sure that children have the opportunity uh, to avail themselves of schooling. That's, that's really, really, really powerful. And the image of knowing that when they have this exposure that your goal really is, that they see their ability to be whatever they want to be. It's very powerful. Uh, so we're here on International Women's Day and uh, every International Women's Day, there is a theme. Uh, so this year's theme is a gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. We talked a little bit earlier about, uh, about farming. And um, so tell us a little bit about your, your uh, farming initiative, Oyeska Greens, um, the agriculture startup that is empowering farmers on the Kenyan coast. And I, I obviously, some of the inspiration obviously was to help your, um, help your community, but talk a little bit about the inspiration. And in that description, talk a little bit about the work of women farmers in Kenya. Thanks again. Uh, and again, uh, most of my work is really inspired by just my growing up. And uh, seeing and the journey that have uh, have taken through to get where I am, and all the knowledge that I have uh, taken in my classes and through my quest to speed and grow uh, my knowledge on everything, including uh, entomology and agriculture. And so when I looked back uh, at our farming and uh, at our farm and realized that there were so many things and so many ways we could improve because agriculture as, as a field is knowledge intensive. Agriculture as a field grows every day by after every science uh, experiment or trials, we gain uh, newer knowledge. Every year there's new varieties that are sold. There are new uh, revelations that we learn, including the power of soil microbes. And so for me, there was that, that uh, desire to uh, use our farm as a place where farmers can 
learn, can come to learn, can come to uh, see the recent uh, agricultural uh, innovations, the recent technologies, or even just see different uh, techniques and uh, at play, different varieties planted and see how they grow, whether they do well or they don't. And so for me, that was one of the really grounding uh, inspiration that uh, led me to start this farm and to empower especially also women because uh, agriculture in Kenya is mostly done by women. And I know they toil so hard from just uh, seeing uh, mothers and women around the community that I grew up in. Every morning waking up, they wake up, they go to their fields, they put their best. And when just because of a lack of knowledge, a lack of uh, using the right variety, a lack of using the right inputs makes the difference if a family is going to get fed or not. If a woman who works so hard is going to harvest or not, for me, I was like, okay, I will use my knowledge to provide a, a place where women and community members can come and learn. So that was the big inspiration. And why women again, because even as they play such critical roles in agriculture, we know that they don't own the land. And so there's land ownership issues. And if you don't own land, how can you improve land? Most chances are you won't, or most chances are you will, but again, you'll do it and not give it your all. So seeing all these challenges that uh, affect women and knowing that we can unleash the power of women, when you make it possible, when you create the opportunities, when you share the knowledge, you know that it can have such uh, amplified impact. For me, there was, no, there was no reason to not do it. And so again, and up to today, we continue to learn. And with climate change, it has been really difficult. For example, right now at the Kenyan coast, it's so hot. And even when women and farmers learn about the newer uh, technologies, we know that it's almost impossible for them to implement it at home. And even just more recently, we had a field day. And I remember there was all these different uh, sections where women could come and learn. But out of all sections, a lot of the community members came to the sack gardens. And, and the reason they say, yes, while there's drip irrigation, thanks to our Rotary uh, Club of Champagne, while you have all these other things that are going on farm, in the end, when we go back to our homes, we can only implement this because we don't have water. We can't even afford getting the trip uh, irrigation uh, kits to, to support this. And so again, this knowing that there are all these challenges and how can we share knowledge and find, and so moving on, it has almost as we're now moving towards uh, showcasing the technologies that we know that community members can afford and continue to find ways for, to work together so that uh, we can allow many, many women farmers to afford. And uh, we, going forward, we think even going smaller and uh, tire gardens, for example, stack garden, where that allows every woman to have a kitchen garden in their home, ensuring that at the end of the day, at least they can have vegetables or they can have something. And so again, it's throughout this uh, being in the ground and seeing and working with the community, we are almost changing every day what we show. And this is based on the reality, the ground reality of the population that we are serving. And but it has been, uh, again, a privilege and very fulfilling and empowering. 
and again I feel uh, so privileged because we have that opportunity to uh, turn our farm into a knowledge uh, platform for other members to learn. Yeah, that, that's really great. And one of the things that I hear is how important it was for people to see in action and someone like yourself as a woman being engaged in this particular uh, this particular activity and profession and, you know, really serving as a mentor. We talked a little bit earlier about, uh, you know, you served as a mentor and, um, you know, talk a little bit about how your mentors have supported you, have supported you academically, uh, professionally, and in, in the conversation around women, you know, why are role models so important for women and girls, particularly in science, technology, engineering, and math. And thank you once again, Gloria. And I always say, you can never be without what you can't see. Mm. And that just one sentence has a lot, it speaks a lot about how can we expect young girls to think of becoming a president when they've never seen a woman president? How can we expect a woman growing in a village somewhere in Kenya and who has never gotten the opportunity to leave her village and to see what other professions that women have undertaken, have been, have, have, have achieved, including you, Gloria, who is our CEO? It is almost impossible. But when we have mentors, when we have role models out in the communities, out in communities meeting uh, these younger uh, students, younger women, and saying, look, look, you can. Just being there and you don't even have to speak, just being there and them noticing and realizing that indeed, and them envisioning themselves growing up to be like you. That's for me is role model, the power of role models. The power of mentors as well is being a mentor, you have the privilege of leading someone, leading others, saying, look, I made these mistakes. You don't have to make these mistakes. Look. I had this challenge, didn't have role models, but you don't have to have this challenge because as I grew up, as I uh, achieved many, and I gained a network and I'm going to use that network that I've gained to open the doors, to open the pathways for you to become. And if I can't, I will ask my friend, I will ask, it's like network. I think of just, I always look at when they have this network of, uh, planes and when they're flying all around. So if I can help you, I can ask Gloria, hey, we have a, a network of for 140 years that has been created. Most chances are there's a pilot somewhere, there's a, pi there, there's a scientist somewhere. And I can use that network to ensure that you realize you're not alone. You realize that you can make it. And also, and if when you face challenges, you can call and, and realize that you should never, never, never be alone. Again, I say the science fields are is still lonely to be a woman, to be a woman of color. But when mentors are there, they've just been so phenomenal. Look, I've never written, growing up, I didn't write a grant for NSF or the USDA, but reaching out to my mentors and saying, I am beginning to write a grant. Could you please share about how, what should I be thinking about? How should I put together? And also looking at, at my write-up once I write it, do I even make a logical sense in, in this write-up? So I think mentors, role models play critical roles in, first of all, ensuring that we are inspiring. We are bringing many more women in the fields that we are in. And secondly, we are not allowing women to leave because we know that 
even though they come in, they will lose them somewhere along the pipeline, ensuring that all the barriers that are and uh, make women to step away from their careers, we make that. We, we are there to support each other. We are there to hold each other and to speak up uh, for others, to, to provide that support that every woman needs to make it, to make it. And to ensure that we are speaking up, advocating for policies so that the policies at the workplace ensure that women are retained wherever they are. I think that's what role models, that's what mentors do. And I've been privileged. And because of that privilege, I use that privilege to do the same. What my mentors have done is the same thing I want to do and I keep doing and do much more than what my mentors have done. Because without them, I wouldn't be here. Without them, I don't know. I, it's a reality that I don't want to think about. I, that, that's, real, that's really important. I love, the, I love how you encapsulated how important it is for, for women to help other women you know, be able to stay in the, and, and thrive in the STEM fields, you know, to be there for each other as mentors, as supporters, you know, as sponsors, uh, because retention is, is a challenge that is ongoing. And, you know, if we do so much inspiration and so much support of getting girls and young women to select these fields, and then they enter into whether it's the university atmosphere or they make it through and they enter into the workplace and they encounter, you know, an environment, you know, that does not allow them uh, to move forward, then, you know, we will never make the progress uh, that, that needs to be made. So I'm, I'm so glad that you, and I know that, you know, along the way, clearly you have experienced these challenges, um, these challenges yourself. Uh, so what advice uh, do you have for, you know, women who have dreams, you know, like, like the ones that inspired you? Like, you know, would you, as they say, what would you tell, you know, your younger self? I think the one message is do not edit the dreams. Both big and small dreams. Don't edit them. See them to the very end. That's great. Do not edit your dreams. That's, right. that's fantastic. Fantastic. Um, uh, you know, and so, you know, some of the message today around uh, International Women's Day and sustainability and climate change, you know, these are very strong, powerful messages that reverberate across our, our, our planet. Um, can you talk a little bit about how women can, uh, and anyone, can work towards uh, gender and, and climate justice? I think, yeah, first and foremost is uh, to really uh, galvanize all of us women. I think we have so much uh, power. And because, first of all, women face the wrath, the, the brand of climate change. It doesn't matter which field, from agriculture, from the field of you know, climate justice, most chances are it's women who get uprooted from their communities, from, from their places. Everything just uh, women are impacted more. So I think first of all, working together would, would allow us to to even be a force to, to play with. And, and I think when we, there's power in, in working together, you know, you know, women think of it, and we make 50% of the global population. Now, if we all have one agenda and, and bold agendas, not even just agenda, bold agendas, and we support each other, I think, and we fund, uh, even uh, all the 
possible fund women so that they get education because education is important. Fund also all the ground ground up uh, institutions, uh, NGOs, everybody that's working to uh, help uh, societies to mitigate, to adapt, and to ensure that climate change and all the challenges of our day do not take away the progress we've made so far. I think it's important that, so there's so many, the different uh, ways and uh, the different um, opportunities. I think while these global challenges are huge, it presents uh, multiple opportunities for all of us, no matter your age, no matter your ethnicity, no matter your geographical location, together and using your talents, using those what is in front of you, whether it's resources and thinking creatively, I think, and again, demanding for more. We cannot sit and not demand for an equal and just and an inclusive world where everyone thrives. And more importantly, I think, where women thrive wherever they choose to be and whichever field they choose to be, I think that is powerful. Um, so you, you, you're very inspiring and you, you sound as though you're incredibly optimistic about these issues, you know, particularly around issues of gender justice and, and, and climate change. Um, even in the face of us seeing where the progress that one would have thought we would have made by now just hasn't been made. And, you know, people are sounding the alarm. Um, you know, do you have any, any, any advice for those who are, you know, like you wanting to move these issues forward and make progress in change? You know, like what could you say to some an advocate who is really, you know, in the trenches, you know, wanting to see progress that would give them the energy or the inspiration, you know, to keep going. I think I would say that, first of all, even though we think uh, your progress is still far away from what we expect, there is progress. Today, women can vote. Today, a woman like me can at least find her way into uh, achieving our dreams. I think, and there are many, many more amazing stories that where you see the courage of women, where you see the courage and the persistence and the will to make it, to make, to move even an inch of progress. So I think, that alone, just realizing that there are many, many stories that show that we are making a little progress, but we can do better. For me, that inspires me. That, that makes me consider that there's still some optimism that things can change. And to know that actually, whenever I talk with other women, they are also, there's that grit that they, they're thinking about, yes, we cannot allow challenges to uh, derail or to uh, to say, okay, I give up. I, I cannot do anything. I just give up. There's no change. There's nothing. But I think there's change. There's change because today we're seeing that the numbers, even though they're slightly changing, they're still changing. And I think looking, I think if you're, feeling that there's no progress, look at the little progresses that are, we've made and now find ways in which you can make that progress. And if you can't, you can ask, you can uh, galvanize uh, uh, your friends, your peers, your community, galvanize others to uh, work together towards at least making a progress. And it, has, it doesn't have to be big, but if we uh, every year create one small step, say, for example, say next this year, I will make sure that the girls around me have 
parts, for example, in Kenya, I know that during the COVID-19, you know, just the lack of having parts for women pushed many young girls into a teenage pregnancies. And if you could say by just the end of the year, I'll make sure that every girl that I know has access to pads. Yeah. That is progress. You know, if any other, and you say to all the other women in my friend, ensure that the girlfriends that you have, the young girls that have had pads so that they can stay at school. If you say, okay, this year I will just set a small goal that any girlfriends that I know will not go to school and be hungry and not do well in the school because they do not have a meal to sustain their mental growth and to sustain their curiosity to learn. And if we all do that, that is progress. I think when we break down these complex, huge uh, problems that we face and just say each one, take just one small issue that faces women. And then by the end of the year, let's look at the progress we made. And if we, all of us take one, I believe there'll be progress. Just, just one, if we could just do one thing, that's, that, that is very, very inspirational. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, I can't believe I haven't asked you, is about, about teaching. You know, you you wanted your your dream was to be a professor, and and now you're a professor. And can you talk a bit about what it means to, you know, have the capacity to transfer knowledge, you know, to the to the next generation, and, and what that has meant to you? This is one of the most powerful things, and to just. Uh, be the steward of knowledge. And again, even when students come, they, they already are very knowledgeable and to just be able to learn together, it's extremely powerful to go to class every day and by the end of the class, know that students have grown one tenth of their knowledge has increased. It's just really powerful. And just seeing students get you see the moments where they're like, wow, appreciate just knowledge. It's, it's just been powerful. I, 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 I've just had the most wonderful time being a teacher. It's been inspiring. And every time, you know, because before teaching, you prepare and you learn. And the more you learn, you share. And students come with such great feedback. And, and then you grow a community. And to know that definitely you've had a mark in in that student's life. It's powerful. It's, it's been just uh, extremely rewarding. And, and I look forward, I always say, I think I will even try to teach even in my old age and just because, and also to know that now today, we, you know, because of the pandemic, we've opened up uh, uh, our teaching model so that it's hybrid. So it doesn't, we don't have to uh, lock people away because they want to learn if they're caught up in something, they can still uh, get to class by Zoom to open the pathways to ensure that many, many more, whoever wants to learn can learn. This is powerful. And uh, I, again, it's been rewarding to be a teacher, to be a researcher. It is a great privilege. I enjoy every day coming to work. I enjoy uh, my work routine and, and I wish and that is why I look back every day and I wish everyone finds their happy place. I wish everyone in the world is able to find that path to that profession, to that thing that makes them just happy. Because when we are all happy, our communities are happy. And then the society is one happy society. So thanks for that question. Yeah. And I, I uh, when you talk about teaching in college, you know, it's been interesting to me. Uh, our uh, youngest daughter is currently a junior uh, in college. And as a matter of fact, she's studying environmental science. Uh, so it has been interesting to see the transition, you know, from Zoom college to partial Zoom college and, you know, just how flexible everyone has had to be in the learning process 
uh, during during the pandemic. And you know, I think they it's been a challenge, but our the students have just been incredibly resilient. And I know that it has been uh, the same for you know all of our educators as well. So I personally thank you for the work that you have been doing during this time and, and really rising to the challenge to make sure that your students' needs were met. But we have a few uh, additional questions that have come in from our participants. And I want to make sure we uh, get in uh, a couple of them before we have to wrap up. All right, so here is one. It says, in recent years, President Kenyatta signed into law that women can own land. What changes have been made since then? Do women own land now, or are they in the process of owning land? I think that, that that's a good question. I think in between changes when law is made, and they still we know that there are many steps that have to just happen for law to be actualized. And and just that just because law has been made doesn't all of all all in one night change everything. So there's still a lot of uh, still issues with land ownership. And again, we're dealing with a situation where before the law, we had only a small percentage of women on land. So it will take time. It will take time to actualize that equality where every woman who who deserves or who has access to can actually own it. It's the title deed has the name of the woman in it. So I think again, it's it's a good step in the right direction. It takes time for laws and everything to achieve that equality as we know even with so many equality issues there's so many laws that have been passed but are we there are we actualized not yet so right yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, even in, in even in the United States, you know, there are so many laws on the books on things like equal pay and you know measures that have been um, voted on and agreed upon, but implementation and enforcement is a totally different story. That that's a really great point when it comes to something like land ownership. Um, let's see. It's uh, next question is: Do small business loans help enough women or are many too inexperienced to apply for them? I think, first of all, yes, small small business loans help a lot. Mm -hmm. Are women inexperienced? No, women know a lot. Yeah, guess what? Women have been accountants, they've been uh, financial uh, planners for many, many. We just don't acknowledge that. We don't, I mean, think of it every day. A woman has to uh, ensure that all the kids are fed. So whatever money that they have, they have, they must do all the budgets. And every day people are fed, people are clothed. There's a lot. Women actually, yeah, and I think women have done a wonderful, wonderful job. And so they are indeed they're not in knowledge about the full of knowledge. I think actually what we need to do is to actually work with them and ensure that we're not breathing over and letting, you know, think, you know, having them think that they don't know what mm -hmm. they don't know doesn't doesn't apply because what they naturally has worked for many years because they've been able to feed all of us. And I think of my own mother. She tried with whatever few resources she had to ensure that all of us went to school, all of us were fed, all of us, however that food looked like, it was still there. So I think mm -hmm. just acknowledging that they know a lot. And with that acknowledgement, then working together to ensure that, you know, to actually give them more laws than actually share knowledge about what they should be or what they shouldn't be. I think mm -hmm. that's how I would do it. Yes, and, and providing them with support. All righty, so um, uh, last question. You were quoted today in the New York Times as a commentator on ongoing research on insects and farming. Are there good mechanisms in a variety of fields for general publications slash popular magazines or journals to find women as commentators? So that's 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 a good point, and we know that to even get to that stage where a, a New York uh, 
science reporter gets to you, it's, there's, there's a backstory before you get there. You have, first of all, you have to be able to be writing all these things, or you have to create, your, you have to be findable. And we know that that's still a lot of uh, scientists uh, can't be findable. And we're in the labs, we're in the lab. If you eventually get to our lab, you'll find us. And because we love what we do, so when I come to the lab, you can, it's hard probably to find me because I'll be engaged in what I'm doing. But again, and that's why I'm really grateful for even programs like Aspen uh, New Institute, New Voices. And what it did actually, it, it uh, first of all, uh, shared with me the fact that a lot of voices from women and the global south and many other uh, smaller countries are not in the main stage. And the reason being because, uh, first of all, women don't fight or women are still, it's hard to find them. And that for me was mind blowing. And, but then again, rather than just tell me the st statistic, they empowered me with how do I write? How do I start ensuring that the science that I'm doing, I can share with it, I can write uh, thoughtful uh, pieces about these issues that I care about. And then through writing uh, and consistently writing, then my voice is out there. So in the case that a New York Times reporter is trying to find somebody, a scientist, that when they do their search, they are picked up. And that's actually something that I tell uh, my students, guys, being there. and ensuring that you're not only uh, publishing in journal articles, but you're also translating. And importantly, because science communication is so important. For so long, exactly. I think scientists have just done the job and then left uh, the journalists to broadcast, share. But again, we are finding that we, 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 we have to be also in front lines sharing uh, the amazing work that doing and by doing so then actually when you know we can be findable by the reporters we can actually and not only be findable but actually the public can enjoy the science exactly. and the results of our work exactly excellent point well esther i want to thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation with me and everyone who who has been with us uh, today. To, I want to thank you for your insight, for your experiences, for your, you know, all the knowledge that you uh, shared with us. It's been remarkable. Um, we know this was clearly the best way to celebrate International Women's Day. Uh, everyone, you know, make sure you can check out Esther's, uh, Dr. Ngumbi's website, which is Esther and Gumbi.com. I want to thank all of my AAUW team members here who were behind the scenes making everything uh, go so smoothly for everyone today. And I would love to have the last word come from you, Dr. Esther Ngumbi, and happy International Women's Day. Thank you. Happy International Women's Day to all the women. We are the most unsung heroes and just pick one action, run with it, and let's make our world a better place, a better, inclusive, and equitable world for all. And let's keep making progress for women. Thank you for hosting me, and thank you, AAUW, for the role that you play in ensuring that women like me really uh, keep on track to achieving their lifelong dreams. Thank you for creating the network and thank you for the support that you give to women. It's a privilege. And, I'm, and again, look, I will look, I will pay it forward. I will keep on doing that. Thank you.